Hi, I'm Steve Cole, and uh, I study the social regulation of gene expression. And I have to confess at the outset that you're not going to learn a great deal about compassion from me today. Uh, not so much because I'm that mean a person, but just because this isn't actually exactly what I study. Uh, I mostly study misery and death and molecular biology, and uh, that's largely because that's what I can get the NIH to fund. Um, they're very preoccupied with disease and death. And so as a consequence of that, um, we've actually spent a few decades developing fairly deep infrastructure to understand how bodies work through the lens of disease and death. And uh, as, as we've done our work in particular, trying to connect up how people live their lives with these kinds of biological processes that add up to what we experience as disease and death, I have become convinced that uh, that same infrastructure might have some um, surprising things to teach us about life. And not just life at the biological level, but life at the level of what you might call moral philosophy. So uh, addressing through the lens of genomics questions like, how are human beings meant to live? And uh, what is the nature of true happiness? And I think the way that we can and sort of make progress in that area is to literally just turn death on its head and think about what the genome, as Fertis was pointing out, was there to do in the first place, which was to promote life. So uh, that said, first let's begin with death, and that's what I seem to understand the best. Um, so that, that, it turns out, is what death looks like at the molecular level. That is uh, a heat plot that uh, represents the differential activity of about 200 human genes. And uh, these genes were measured in about 15 people. Seven people in the top row there exposed to high levels of one of our most toxic environmental risk factors, and another eight people, I think, in the, the rows below. And what those organized blocks of green and red portray are about 130 genes that are systematically downregulated, their activity uh, basically suppressed in the white blood cells of people exposed to this risk factor, about 78 genes that are systematically upregulated. And it turns out that these genes aren't a random smattering of all 22,000 genes in our genome. They actually represent um, a few sort of coordinated blocks of activity. So for instance, within the group that's systematically upregulated, there's one module involved in uh, inflammation, as Fertis and uh, we heard yesterday uh, as well. Inflammation uh, is a great thing in small amounts, but it's, it's sort of like an iron. It's very good for solving certain small problems, but if you leave it on, you're going to burn your house down. Um, and that's because inflammation serves as sort of, if you will, inadvertent fertilizer for the development of cancer, uh, cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, just about everything that kills us in advanced uh, industrialized societies is sort of promoted, essentially, by l extended periods of uh, high-level expression of these kinds of genes. Uh, in the downregulated group, there's also another block of genes, actually two other blocks of genes, that uh, seem to represent some kind of, if you will, organized conspiracy here. Um, one of them involving genes invo that should be defending cells against the uh, basically infection by intracellular pathogens such as viruses, and another block that uh, is crucial for producing a particular kind of antibody response. So this kind of transcriptional shift wouldn't be particularly surprising to us, I think, if the kind of risk factor that we were talking about here were the usual kind of physico-chemical insult that sometimes we, we all fear the most in terms of health, things like benzene in the water or cigarette smoke in our lungs. But the risk factor that we're looking at here actually is simply the extent to which the people in the, the top seven rows of this plot uh, show, well, basically, the, the extent to which they feel disconnected from the rest of humanity. So the extent to which they're lonely. It's loneliness that seems to be orchestrating this systematic shift in the gene expression profiles within these white blood cells. Um, so that in itself is perhaps a little bit of a puzzle. We actually think we understand reasonably well now why that's happening. And part of the clue comes from the fact that as we carried out more studies like this, it became apparent that this particular type of transcriptional shift isn't especially unique to loneliness. As we looked at a variety of other types of adverse life experience, we found very similar kinds of shifts in the gene expression profiles within uh, white blood cells. Um, so what this suggests to us is that really any time human beings confront extended periods of threat or uncertainty, uh, for whatever reason, our genome has evolved to execute this particular change in, if you will, sort of the basal transcriptional stance or the, the sort of the basal defensive posture of our immune cells. 
And in the last few years, we've learned a fair amount about how this actually takes place. We now know which cells carry out this response. In other words, essentially, which cells are listening to your psychology and changing their molecular stripes as a consequence. Um, we've also learned a fair amount about the signaling pathways that allow experiences of the world to get converted into hormonal, hormonal or uh, neurotransmitter representations within the body and the extent to which they can then disseminate into the vicinity of our cells, interact with receptors, activate transcription factors. And it's these transcription factors that actually physically structure the changes in gene expression that we see here. Um, I'm sure you would all be excited if I went through an extensive biochemistry lecture mapping out all this kind of stuff, but I'm presuming that's not what you came here for today. So suffice it to say um, that we actually uh, know now a fair amount uh, about how not to live, both sort of uh, in the, the abstract sense of like, wow, those are rough lives leading up to these changes in gene expression, but also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you run these gene expression profiles at high level for long periods of time, uh, you will promote the development of most of the diseases that actually uh, lead to morbidity and mortality, literally shortening your lifespan. So uh, clearly, we understand a lot about misery and death and how that's all connected up. But what does this tell us about what we should do instead? I mean, obviously, we don't want to pursue this kind of life that adds up to that kind of molecular risk factor. Uh, but it's not actually totally clear what we should do instead. It turns out that there are lots of different ways of being not miserable, or at least maybe two different ways of, of being not miserable. And these are two ways that have been, uh, if you will, debated for uh, actually at, at this point, millennia. Questions about essentially you could think about it as the nature of the truly good life or the nature of, of true happiness, perhaps. So one version of this suggests that the, the, the good life comes from having lots of happy experiences, of just selecting um, things that you like to do, people you like to spend time with, drugs you like to take, all kinds of things that make you feel momentarily happy. And if you just sum up a bunch of moments of happiness, that's actually what creates the good life. Um, so you can think of this as sort of the Epicurean perspective on, on happiness. Uh, a second view suggests that, uh, in fact, the truest form of happiness comes not from seeking happiness, the pursuit of happiness in your own life, but the pursuit of uh, some kind of broader happiness outside yourself in the world. So dedicating yourself to a higher purpose or cause, a more sort of, if you will, eudaimonic version of happiness, um, a kind of this Aristotelian or more Platonic view that the most abiding, healthy kind of happiness doesn't come from momentary euphoria. It comes from this participation in sort of, if you will, the grand human enterprise. Um, it's arguable that this eudaimonic type of happiness might actually lead to somewhat less total sum of momentary uh, euphorias than would actively pursuing uh, happiness on, on all occasions without respect to these kinds of external values. So it, there, there actually is something of a choice between these two kinds of things. So with that in mind, we might ask, well, okay, which of these two types of happiness really best liberates us from that molecular soup of death that I just talked about earlier? Um, and so we recently had an opportunity to ask that kind of a question in collaboration with Barb Fredrickson's group. Um, she and her team carried out a study in which they recruited uh, 80 individuals, um, slightly more than that, but about 80 individuals from the, the North Carolina area, and measured eudaimonic and hedonic well-being using well-established instruments, and then to provide a kind of a psychological reference point, a sort of a psychological version of misery, they measured uh, the abject misery of depression using a well-established epidemiologic instrument. And they also took a tube of blood and isolated white blood cells, and that allowed us to carry out genome-wide transcriptional profiling, where we essentially poll the activity of all 22,000 human genes uh, to then determine to, to what extent do these kinds of, if you will, these distinct ways of being happy or well in the world uh, really sort of comprise the opposite of that risky molecular profile that I talked about earlier. So this is what we saw. Um, if we look at the psychological level and sort of create a, a space defined at the bottom by high levels of that, that sort of psychological anchor, the Center for Epidemiologic Studies depression scale, so that uh, in this system, going up on the graph is a good thing. That's towards happiness and the good life, going down more towards depression. 
we can then look at the effects of being high versus low on these different types of, of well-being uh, with respect to this, this system. So for example, if we look at people with high levels of hedonic well-being, that turns out to move you a considerable distance in the opposite direction of depression and misery. Great, that's exactly what should happen, not terribly surprising. Um, we might expect that people with high levels of eudaimonic well-being uh, maybe move generally in the opposite direction from depression and misery, but perhaps not quite as much because they're busy being sort of momentarily miserable trying to save the world. Uh, actually, it turns out, to our, our great surprise, that um, that's not the case. Um, they seem to be every bit as un unhappy as people actively pursuing uh, hedonic well-being at every possible occasion. So uh, it's possible that, that you know, sort of pursuing perfection in life in the world, at least at the psychological level, um, delivers a, as, every bit as consoling or a, a healthy, happy life as uh, actively pursuing happiness itself. So that's the psychological result. How about at the level of the molecular biology? So here we've got actually two dimensions that are of interest. One of them defined by uh, sort of inflammatory biology of the sort that we just talked about earlier, and another dimension defined by those sort of down-regulated genes that should be protecting us against infectious diseases. So I'm going to put up here a little two-dimensional space, and I'm going to rotate it on the side so that, again, if you're doing well on both of these dimensions, the vector will head up. If you're doing poorly or in this more sort of risky way, the vector will head down. Um, and on these two dimensions, we have, again, high levels of expression of antibody and antiviral-related genes, and um, low levels of expression of these inflammatory genes. So uh, if we project people with high levels of eudaimonic well-being into this two-dimensional gene expression space, so that good is at the top and bad is at the bottom, that's what we see. They're headed in a pretty good direction, relatively high expression of antibody and antiviral-related genes, relatively low expression of inflammation-related genes. Um, so that looks great at the molecular biological level. That seems to agree pretty well with the psychology. Um, interestingly, though, when we looked at people with high levels of hedonic well-being, they seem to be headed in a different direction. So although they're experiencing themselves as being sort of happy in the world, at the biological level, they seem to be showing, if anything, higher levels of inflammatory biology and lower levels of antiviral and antibody-related genes, um, which raises sort of an interesting question. Um, I mean, it suggests that basically there's a, a discontinuity between the way these two types of happiness or well-being or at least being not miserable is experienced at the level of our conscious lives and the way it's actually being experienced at the molecular level within our bodies. Uh, somewhere in that whole system, uh, there seems to be the possibility, at least, of different answers to the same question, depending upon whether you're looking at the level of human experience and psychology or whether you're looking at this through the lens of this more sort of molecular effort to stay alive. And I think that raises kind of a, a, an interesting broader question about how we can start answering questions uh, at the level of sort of what's good and what's bad, not necessarily just by introspecting, but also by, in some sense, sort of polling the opinion of the human genome, which with you know, 10 million years of experience helping us survive and thrive in the, year, uh, in the world might have learned a thing or two about sort of the true nature of, of human beings and uh, the best way for us to be in this world. So uh, while I don't want to get taken, I'm, I'm done, no problem there. While I don't want to get us uh, you know, sort of taken too far afield, um, I, I do think it's possible that uh, this, this you know, sort of elaborate genomics infrastructure could provide um, a different way of asking big questions about life by thinking about it in terms of the smallest elements of life, our, our sort of our molecular being. Um, and with that in mind, I would just uh, like to thank you for your attention and especially thank Barb and her group and also John Cacciopo and his group for uh, allowing me to collaborate in their excellent studies. Thanks.